Hey there, once again, YouTube. Oh, man, looks like I missed uh, the old faithful eruption, guys. Oh, just missed it right at the end. Oh, well. So, my name is Ben Ferriolo, and I am dedicated to the responsible and accurate seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. First off, if you have not already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided under my email address in the description box below. It contains a great deal of information, including how to understand the many types of plots and charts that people use, how to find, access, and analyze seismic data, and it also contains hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images regarding a great many seismic events and swarms on many different pages. Trust me, you would be surprised to what you find. Today, I'm going to just briefly talk about a couple things. There were two earthquakes near where I live, somewhat where I live, and also there was somewhat of an earthquake swarm in Colorado. Now, if you see some of my recent videos, you maybe notice that I have a very high interest in the Dozero volcanic system and its plumbing, which is pretty much completely unknown. People don't even know what the plumbing system is like, so who knows what's down there. Uh, this did not, the swarm that occurred last night and is kind of still going on a little bit, did not occur near Dozero, near Glenwood Springs, Colorado. It actually occurred near the, well, I think the New Mexico border, I believe it was New Mexico, uh, north of the New Mexico border, near Mount Lindsay. Have you ever heard of Mount Lindsay before in Colorado? If so, please let me know if you have any information. We're going to get into that in just a second, but first... We're just going to take a quick look at two of the earthquakes that have hit Washington State today. Now, as you may know, Washington State has a special interest in my heart because this is where I live, right here. See this earthquake right here? This is magnitude 1.6 at 8.7 kilometers in depth, struck on February 28th, 2019 at 317 UTC exactly. Right here is also where the closest seismic station is. The closest seismic station to the Monroe earthquake actually is right above the epicenter. So we got a very good look. I'll show that in just a second. But there is also over here on the Olympic Peninsula, there's also a magnitude 1.1, supposedly at negative 0.4 kilometers in depth. The elevation is somewhat high right here. Remember, zero kilometers itself is usually sea level. It's usually what it is. So negative 0.4 is believable, which because that would probably be just a little bit above sea level, but still underground. But let's zoom in on the Monroe earthquake, which I will show first. This struck pretty close to me. I didn't feel it, though. I did not feel it. I searched my memory banks, and I did not feel it. Actually, it looks like nobody felt it at all. It was a magnitude 1.6 at 8.7 kilometers in depth. Now, recently, there was a magnitude 1.1 in Pennsylvania that 90 people felt, but this 1.6, which was stronger than that magnitude 1.1, this did not even, it wasn't even felt by anybody at all. Even me, who lives right here in Bothell Woodenville. So here's the event page for the magnitude 1.6 at 8.7 kilometers in depth. Again, nobody felt it. Let's check out Origin to see the closest seismic station. I already know what the closest station is. The magnitude uncertainty is very small, very nil. So it's most likely that a magnitude 1.6 is right on the dot. Location uncertainty is also very, very small, which means they had a good time locating this earthquake. They did it quite well. And even the depth uncertainty is very small. So all three aspects of this earthquake were perfectly constrained, almost perfectly. So let's go to phases and see the closest station is BHW in the UW network. Again, I said BHW is right on top of the epicenter, basically. So we'll get a good look. Here we are on the Iris data select URL builder. Let's go to BHW, test dash EHC. I already have the time periods all set. And yep, it downloaded. Let's check it out. So again, this was magnitude 1.6 at 8.7 kilometers in depth, right next to my house, actually. I mean, not right next to, but very close. And we see, again, I've been seeing earthquakes like this. Remember I told you in the last video that I'm still learning seismology, guys, and I do not know what a downwards dipping P wave means. I know it's important for some aspect. I know it is because I've seen it somewhere else and I cannot find that research paper about it. But downwards dipping P wave. Usually we see one uh, upwards gliding P waves, but recently I've been seeing earthquakes that go down at first instead of up. And I want to know the difference. What is the difference between an upwards gliding P wave and a downwards gliding P wave? I want to know what the importance of that is. But if you think about it, on a short period vertical channel, and let's just say a vertical channel, it doesn't matter if it's short period or broadband. So let's say you have a vertical channel, right? And you have the instrument on you, on your desk, 
right next to you. Let's say the seismic instrument is right next to you on your desk. And let's say you take your hand, you take a fist, and you hit your desk as hard as possible. Notice how the force of your fist is going downwards. Well, if you were to do that and look at the seismogram of you hitting your desk, it would show a downwards dipping P wave because the force went down first, right? And vertical channels record up as up and down as down. But still, even from distance stations, I want to know the importance of that because this was obviously an earthquake. It obviously was not a quarry blast or anything from the surface going downwards. But I still find it interesting that we still do see downwards dipping P waves, even from deeper earthquakes. I mean, this earthquake wasn't too deep, but you know what I mean. Again, we have BHW in the UW network, which is pretty much right on top of the epicenter of this earthquake that occurred not too far from me. So let's go to the spectrogram. Dominant high range frequencies as normal. Looks just like a normal run of the mill earthquake, except for the downwards dipping P wave. Normal everything, I guess. Now let's check out the spectra. Whoops. Did not mean to do that. Let's check out the spectra plot. See what the dominant frequencies of this Monroe, Washington earthquake. And dominant frequencies start at about 1.3 hertz. And uh, let's see, it looks like there's two bursts in dominant frequencies. So I'm just going to say it ended at about 13.4 hertz with some smaller spikes after that. But doesn't seem to go beyond 25 hertz very much. So, so that's pretty much it. That's the magnitude 1.6 at 8.7 kilometers in depth in Monroe, Washington. So there is that 1.6 over there in Monroe. Now over here, we have a magnitude 1.1 near Low Fall, Washington that was reportedly at negative 0.4 kilometers in depth. Again, right over here, here's Seattle, Kirkland, east side. Over here is the Olympic Peninsula, the start of it. Let's go to the event page. Again, here's the event page for the magnitude 1.1 and negative 0.4 kilometers in depth on the Olympic Peninsula. Again, this is the second earthquake in the past 24 hours for Washington State. Not too crazy, but usually near my place, we usually don't get that many earthquakes. Again, nobody reported feeling either of the events. And let's go to origin and see what the closest seismic station was to this event. Arrival time is negative 0.8 seconds. What? Negative? That's weird. I actually do not know what negative means. That is very strange. So I guess it was literally right at the epicenter. <laughs> so apparently PBB013 borehole from UNAVCO. This is our UNAVCO borehole in the PB network. Remember the plate boundary observatory, PBO? PB network. Let's go download the data. PBB013, right? Dash dash EHZ. Got the date set already. And yep, it worked. Let's check it out in Swarm. Here we are in the seismic program swarm for borehole 013, which is the closest seismic station to the magnitude 1.1 near Low Fault, Washington on the Olympic Peninsula. Again, they reported it that it struck at negative 0.4 kilometers in depth. I'm starting to think the possibility of this is a quarry blast. A very strong quarry blast right above where the borehole is located, possibly or some type of explosion, because here, let me go all the way out with the frequency range, 55, all the way out, only goes up to 50, but look at the dominant high frequencies. The frequencies end around 40, actually, you know what? Let's go to the spectra plot and see what the dominant frequencies are. Very strange, very strange. Wow, the strongest frequency of this earthquake it was 10.3 hertz, and the second strongest frequency was 25.6 hertz. So very high frequencies, no dominant low frequencies, actually. But let's go back to the spectrogram. Notice how this event is extremely peculiar. doesn't even look like any normal earthquake I've ever seen, ever. And here is the waveforms. Look at that. I have to zoom in that much just to spread out the waveforms. I have no idea what caused this at all. Now, I want to draw out the smaller amplitudes, so how do we do that? Let's go to manual scale, and let's say 10,000. Change the waveforms, make the smaller ones appear. There we go. That helps. Let's zoom in a little more, because I just want to see what the tail end was like. So 5,000. So let's try 5,000. It'll cut out the main event, but it'll draw out the smaller amplitudes. Look at that. Very strange end tail. You, you notice that? Look at that. Very, very peculiar. Almost looks like a type of snowman or something, right? 
So again, this is the magnitude 1.1 on the Olympic Peninsula, which personally to me makes zero sense. Let's turn auto scale back on and take a look at the main burst right here. Yeah, I have no clue what that could be. Kind of almost looks like one of the Kilauea explosive eruptions, but not even close to us. Spectrogram is way off. Spectrogram looks way different. But still, I'm just saying, very odd event. So, what do you think happened here? Who knows? Notice there is an earthquake swarm being reported for Colorado. Now, beforehand, if you have been following me, you know that I have a great interest in the Dozero Volcanic System, which is, I believe it's up here somewhere. Let's see, let's see, near Glenwood Springs, Gypsum, yeah. So Dozero Volcano that I'm interested in, in, I'm very interested in its plumbing and how it works, which I don't think anybody knows how it works at all. But the Dozero Volcanic System is right up here. Glenwood Springs is right here. A lot of the seismicity that we've been seeing lately that I believe is connected to the Dozero Volcanic System has been occurring in this area. Well, let's go all the way south. All the way down here, Colorado Springs is up here. Now here's New Mexico. Here's Santa Fe, New Mexico. Here's the Val's Supervolcanic Caldera, right down here. And let's go all the way up. So we do have an earthquake swarm right here with one extra earthquake being reported for Trinidad. But I'm not gonna focus on that right now. I'm gonna focus on this swarm right here. Let's zoom in just real quick. So notice something just right off the bat, it says, I don't know why it doesn't say it anymore. Let's zoom back out one more time, Mount Lindsay. Keep that in mind. Notice Mount Lindsay is right there. So let's look at these earthquakes just real fast. They have a 1.0 reported for Trinidad, which was the one all the way over there. Okay, so then they have a 1.4 as part of the swarm. And it was not a rapid fire swarm. They did not occur in a very bunched, close uh, space. I already looked at some of the waveforms. I am gonna show you the seismic data in, in just one second, but I wanna look at something else just real quick. But let's go through these earthquakes, 1.9 and 5.0 kilometers, a 1.2 and 9.5 kilometers, a 1.2 at 10 kilometers, another 1.9 at 5.0 kilometers, which apparently someone did feel, a 1.4 at 10.7 kilometers, a 1.3 at 10 kilometers, and then all of a sudden, we had a 3.8 at 16.1 kilometers in depth, and then there was a 1.2 at 10.8 kilometers in depth, and then a magnitude 3.6 at 5.3 kilometers in depth. Let's look at the event page for the magnitude 3.8 just real fast. So here's the event page for the magnitude 3.8 near Mount Lindsay, east, northeast of Alamosa East, Colorado, at 16.1 kilometers in depth. 51 people reported feeling this earthquake. That's a good amount of people for 3.8, though I was uh, expecting a few more people to feel it, though, because it was 3.8. But it was a little bit deeper than usual, so that might be why people all the way up north, even north of Salida, Colorado, felt it. I bet some people down in New Mexico felt it as well. All right, let's go backwards. Let's look at the 3.6. This one was the magnitude 3.6, which was a little more shallow than the 3.8. This one occurred at 5.3 kilometers in depth, again, on February 28th at 1533 UTC. 15 people reported feeling this event. We go down. Seems like that's the same did you feel it map. Very same, very similar. So probably part of the same process and in the same location. But again, I want to point your attention to Mount Lindsay. Now I thought that was very interesting that there's a mountain right there because I'm unsure of any known volcanic activity in this area. But I bet it's possible though. I mean, we have a super volcano right down here in New Mexico. Sorry, I was wrong. The Valles Caldera is not right here. It's right here. You can see that right there. Um, USGS even has that on their page and then we go up and then the Dozero volcanic system is up here But those are the two closest volcanoes But let's take a look at pictures of Mount Lindsay and you tell me if this does not look like a volcano So here is Mount Lindsay. I looked it up on Google Mount Lindsay is a high mountain summit on the Sierra Blanca Massif in the Sangre de Cristo range of the uh, Rocky Mountains of North America 14,048 foot 14 er is located in the Sangre de Cristo land grant 10.8 miles north of the community of Fort Garland in Costilla County, Colorado, United States. Notice the elevation is 14,042 feet. Now let's go to Mount Rainier. Here's Mount Rainier, 14,411 feet. So really, Mount Lindsay is almost as tall as Mount Rainier. And we already know Mount Rainier is extremely tall, guys. I believe 
Let's see, uh, Tahoma or Tacoma is the highest mountain. Yep, it's the highest mountain of the Cascade Range in the Pacific Northwest and the highest mountain in the U.S. state of Washington. It is a large active strata volcano. We already know that. So this is very similar in the elevation, right? But now let's take a look at some pictures of Mount Lindsay. So here is, I do not know which direction this is facing. I believe they are facing southwest, this picture, I believe. I believe. But here is another picture of Mount Lindsay. I really want you to see if we can get a better shot. Let's see if we can get... All these pictures are too tiny. Why are these pictures so dang tiny? Oh, here's another one right here. You tell me that does not look like a volcano. That looks like a volcano. That actually kind of looks like Lassen Peak from that vantage point right there. I know this image is kind of tiny, but look, doesn't that look like Mount Rainier? Let's go back and look at some images of Mount Rainier from a good distance. Here's kind of a good view. Notice the little bump right there. I forget which peak that is. Let me know if you know what peak that is. And then we see Mount Rainier right here. And then let's take a look at this picture from Mount Lindsay. Notice there's a little peak right there and there is Mount Lindsay right there. Doesn't that look very similar to Mount Rainier? Obviously that doesn't mean it's a volcano, but I just wanted you guys to take a look at what Mount Lindsay actually looks like. It literally looks like a volcano. Guys, it really, really does. And I swear, when looking at some of these pictures of the highest peak of Mount Lindsay, it does look like there are tephra and ash deposits. You notice that? Look at that. I believe this is a volcano. But check this out. So why don't we test this for a second? See, we have Mount Lindsay, which is in Colorado. Let's type in Mount Lindsay volcano. Is there any information on here about Mount Lindsay being a volcano? Mount Lindsay is a high mountain summit. Look, missing. This is missing the word volcano. What? What? 14ers Mount Lindsay missing the word volcano. So they don't even talk about volcanoes in here. Everything. Seriously, you try this yourself. Go on Google and try to research about Mount Lindsay and anything that has to do with any type of historical volcanic activity near Mount Lindsay in Colorado. There's nothing. There is absolutely, literally nothing. And then you see volcanism here, but this is talking about Mount Lindesay, Rhyolite. Uh, yeah, that's in Australia and New Zealand, apparently. That's what they say. But actual Mount Lindsay in Colorado, they have nothing on there. They're, they don't even have an article saying it's not a volcano. So we don't even know if it is a volcano or if it's not. But we already saw some of the images and it definitely looks like a volcano, guys, in my opinion. And from the distance, from a certain angle, it even looks like Mount Rainier and even has almost the same elevation as Mount Rainier, though I believe it's about 400 feet shorter. But still, that means it's huge, guys. And we already know that Colorado and New Mexico are volcanic anyways. So is it much of a stretch to say that it is volcanic? Look at this area behind this guy. Look at this. This looks just like some type of volcanic landscape, doesn't it? I believe it is. So let's go back. Again, Mount Lindsay is right here. Let's zoom in just real quick. A lot of these earthquakes were happening right here. Let's see what the closest seismic station was to these earthquakes. So what do you guys think about Mount Lindsay? Do you think that it could be a volcano? I think it is. I think it's some type of dormant strata volcano that people have never heard of or ever, never even researched about. But I think research should be done on every mountain in the United States that even has a possibility of being a volcano. So it says SDCO in the U.S. network is the closest station. Let's go to Iris. We have SDCO already set on here in the U.S. network. Notice here is Mount Lindsay right here, Blanca Peak. And this is reportedly the closest seismic station, SDCO. So it's very, very close to the swarm epicenter. So the swarm occurred along this line right about here. Again, what do you think about Mount Lindsay? Is it a volcano? Now let's grab the data from the closest seismic station, which is SDCO. So US SDCO 00 BHZ. I already have the time period set and we are set. So let's download the data. And here's another panoramic view of Mount Lindsay and the Hurfano. Please let me know if I said that right or wrong. Hurfano Peak? I don't know. But look at this in the background. 
Look at that. Doesn't that look like a volcano? Like an old, old, old volcano, guys. I bet it is. So here we are in the Seismic Program Swarm with the data stream from SDCO in the U.S. Network, which was the closest station to the recent pretty good-sized earthquake swarm that has been shaking Mount Lindsay in Colorado, in southern Colorado, just north of the New Mexico-Colorado border. Let's go forward. What is this I see right here? Is this a low-frequency event? Very tiny, but I don't know what that could mean. Very tiny. But let's move on and see if there's anything bigger. This is before the swarm started. Just before the swarm started. We barely see anything. Barely, barely, barely. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Maybe a few little tiny microquakes popping off here and there, here and there, here and there. Let's keep going forward. And then finally we see a few earthquakes. Very tiny, but earthquakes nonetheless. Dominant high range frequencies. I'm probably going to guess they're probably two magnitude 0.5s, actually. Actually, they're going about 2,000 amplitude count. Broadband, eh, yeah, actually, probably about 0 0.5, 0 0.8. But let's go forward. I do not want to get into this too much. I want to look at the more major activity. And then we did see some more earthquakes right here. But then look at what we saw right here at about 216 UTC on the 28th. What is this? This is not a teleseism. Not a teleseism. But what is it? It has dominant low frequencies. I don't know what this is. It looks like it does have a clear P and S wave and surface wave, like a very deep earthquake, right? Could this be a very, very deep earthquake signaling that something was possibly coming up from the depths of the earth? I don't know. But this, again, this was very tiny, only going to 200 amplitude count. But the actual P and S waves only go up to about 50 amplitude count. So it was very, very weak, very weak. But let's go forward. Keep going forward, little tiny microquakes here and there. A few microquakes here and there. Some of them happening in rapid succession. And then finally, we do see the main magnitude 3.8, which they said occurred at, 3.8 occurred at, drum roll please, 16.1 kilometers in depth. And that's this one right here. Notice the strange characteristics. Look at this. This is the strangest earthquake I have ever seen. Well, actually, I've seen some pretty strange earthquakes in my life. <laughs> Trust me, go to the exotic events page in the seismic events drop down menu on my website and you'll know what I'm talking about. So again, I want to zoom in on this and check out the dominant frequencies of this earthquake. Very interesting. Again, this was the magnitude 3.8 at 16.1 kilometers in depth. Dominant frequency seemed to rise all the way to about 12.1 hertz and then dips down and then took, took a very, very sharp dip all the way down at about 16.3 hertz and ended right about there. Let's turn that back on. Again, this was a very strange earthquake. I want to show you just one more time. Sorry if I'm repeating myself. But look at the spikes. Now, we should not be seeing these in this type of earthquake, guys. Look at the really high frequencies, P and S wave arrivals. But what I am unfamiliar with is what these are. Usually you should see a clear, like let's say something's really deep, maybe 20, 30 kilometers. You should see a clear P and S wave arrival with possibly even a surface wave arrival, maybe Love or Rayleigh waves. But that is not what we see here. We see two additional spikes that make no sense that should not be there. What were those two spikes from, guys? What do you think that's from? I don't know, but the two, the tallest spike is going to 491,000 amplitude count, almost 492,000. So let's go back. We got persistent rescale off. Let's go back to the spectrogram. So we just looked at the magnitude 3.8 at 16.1 kilometers in depth. Many, many, many aftershocks occurring. In, and look at these spikes. Again, we see many of these high frequency spikes. That is so strange. Look at that. I mean, obviously, that could be two earthquakes occurring in rapid succession. Like, this could be one earthquake. And this could be another earthquake. But still, even back on this one, those spikes are very strange. Let's go back to the spectrogram and go forward. Aftershocks, aftershocks, aftershocks. I'm not seeing any strong or even moderate low-frequency background tremor. Almost nothing at all but the earthquakes themselves. This station is actually pretty good at not showing surface activity. Of course, any station can show surface activity, but still, it does pretty well. Then the swarm did calm down around 5 UTC or so, and still pretty calm, pretty calm. Let's zoom out. Pretty calm. Little tiny, tiny microquakes throughout the day. Keep going forward, keep going forward. 
Keep going forward, keep going forward. Then we have another earthquake right here. Again, with strange high frequency characteristics. Of course, these could be tectonic, but again, I thought it's very strange that it occurred near a possible volcano. I'm not saying that it is a volcano for sure, but Mount Lindsay does look like some type of unknown stratovolcano. I really do personally believe that. I really do. And something else that's a little frustrating is when you go to research about it and to see if it is a volcano, there's no resources online at all. There's not even a resource saying, no, it's not a volcano. And there's not even a resource saying, yes, it is a volcano. Nothing. Not even one spoken word. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm the first one in human history asking if Mount Lindsay is a volcano. Because seriously, there's, nobody does any work on it at all. Nobody even researches it at all. Here's some more events right there. Little tiny events throughout the day. No, there weren't really any more major earthquakes throughout the day. Again, no low frequency background tremor, which is a very good sign. I'd be concerned if I saw low frequency background tremor in conjunction with earthquake swarms. And keep going forward. It seems that activity starts to increase once again. A few tiny microquakes here and there. And then we see the magnitude 3.6 right here now this looks like a normal earthquake this looks a little more normal but still has some of those strange high frequency characteristics very sharp look at how sharp the waveforms are guys very very sharp so what do you think this swarm was caused by and do you think mount lindsay could be a volcano an unknown stratovolcano and here are the dominant frequencies in the spectra plot strongest frequency of this earthquake was about 7.34 hertz Log power log frequency back on. And let's see, as as of 10.33 a.m. Pacific time, February 28th, 2019, we have the most recent data stream right here. I'm going to go through it. Not much, not much, not much, not much. Still no low frequency background tremor, except for that strange low frequency event at the beginning of the day on this chart. But that's pretty much it. And then the data stream's over because that is the most recent right there. So, very interesting, guys. What do you think this earthquake swarm was caused by? Please let me know below. Also, don't forget to check out my website. I am working on a multitude of different things right now. And my next videos will be about a different part of my website, the how to read spectrograms, seismic plots, and more. Because I'm going to start doing videos for a lot of my how-to sections on my website because there are some people out there who either have a hard time reading and are still capable of doing seismic analysis and want to know what I'm talking about or there's also people out there who would rather prefer watching a video so I would I'm just gonna make some videos for those parts of my website please go check out the seismic events drop down menu and also go to the quake swarms page also in the seismic events drop down menu and check out that weird crazy swarm that recently struck southwest Wyoming why have there been earthquake swarms striking in very odd locations lately, guys? Let me know what you think, because Southwest Wyoming has been seeing some seismicity, some low-frequency seismicity, and even Utah has been seeing some swarming, too. Yellowstone is a little bit more calm this month, but still, I do believe in the next month we will see another rapid-fire swarm break out there. And then here in Colorado, we had an earthquake swarm. Very strange. And then some more earthquakes popped off in Washington, so the United States could be starting to get kind of active. And just for shits and giggles, I am on the real-time tremor map. See, tremor.pnsn.org slash real-time to see what the recent tremors are. Remember, not every, not every single one of these red dots is a true tectonic tremor or volcanic tremor or whatever they record. This is, sometimes there can be mistakes. There can be mistakes, guys. See, down here it says, this higher rate, lower accuracy version. So it's higher rate, lower accuracy. There can be many, as you can see down here false detections but still usually when you see multiple ones grouped together usually that means there is some type of tremor event going on this is the past three hours as of 10 35 a.m pacific time february 28th let's go forward past six hours only 0 0.6 hours of tremor basically pretty calm guys let's go to the past 48 hours only 2.3 hours of tremor i remember one time i did see about 40 the highest count I think I've seen is about 38 to 40 hours of tremor within 48 hours. That was during one of the heightened ETS episodes that was occurring on the Olympic Peninsula right here in Washington. Again, the Seattle fault line is overdue. Actually, excuse me, not overdue, but it hasn't ruptured for 1,100 years. So it is possible that Seattle is looking 
towards two major earthquakes. The Cascadia subduction zone should be rupturing in the next 100 years. Personally, I believe it'll happen in the next 10 years, but that's just my belief. And then the Seattle Fault hasn't ruptured far before that, 1,100 years ago. So I believe both faults are ready to, to produce a large earthquake. The Seattle Fault only can go to about a magnitude 7, though. So it'll still be pretty bad. A magnitude 7 right in downtown Seattle, especially with all the building codes and all the buildings that are not up to code. I mean, it's pretty bad down there, guys. They really need to start retrofitting their buildings for earthquakes. And especially that new Alaskan Way Viaduct SR99 tunnel. No thanks. I'm not going in there, guys. I'm sorry. If a, if a major earthquake happens and the ground liquefies, guess what's going to happen if you're stuck in that tunnel? Sorry, guys. No thanks. That's one of my biggest fears. <laughs> so I hope you guys have a great day. Keep an eye on Mount Lindsay in Colorado. Let me know if you can find any resources as to if it's a volcano or not, or anybody talking about volcanic activity in that area because I really want to know. I'm going to be looking for it as well, so the more people we have looking for the research, the higher the chances that we will find something. But then again, if nobody's ever done anything about it, then, you know, we won't find anything. So I hope you guys all had a great day. Keep an eye out for more videos. Go to my website and all that good stuff. Also, don't forget to check out Scott's new channel called The NW Geology Guy. A link is in the description box below as usual. He's got a pretty good channel, pretty good content too, especially his recent video about the ETS Tremor episodes uh, on Cascadia. So, let me know what you think. God bless. Remember, the truth is considered hater fear to those who hater fear the truth. Ben Fariolo, signing off.